Hello, beautiful souls. In today's episode of the Silicon Valley to Spirituality Show, we have the founder of Conscious Asians, David Hu. He started off as an engineer, then he had a spiritual awakening, and he is going to share all of his newfound knowledge on how to become a more conscious person with all of us today. So without further ado, let's jump into the podcast. All right, beautiful people. It is your host, Sebo Shen. I am back with another episode of Silicon Valley to Spiritual Alley. Today, I have a wonderful guest. His name is David Hu. Um, I met David a few months ago. He runs a group called Conscious Agents, but um, or Conscious Asians, not Conscious Agents. Conscious Asians, I'm thinking about Donald Hoffman right now. But um, getting connected with David through this group uh, opened up a brand new world to me, which is a whole group of Asian people that were expanding their consciousness, really diving deeper beyond just their external achievements, where they worked at Google, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, and really gave me access to a group of Asians that, in my opinion, were much more holistic in their approach to their life. And we all know that the premise of this podcast is talking about people who have been really focusing on their career pursuits, their external achievements, and then finding more value, finding more deepness, finding more joy by pursuing things that are in alignment with their spirit and soul. So I wanted to introduce David Hu today. David, thank you very much for being a guest on my podcast. Thank you so much, Sabo, for that beautiful context sharing um, that I really resonate with. And again, very honored to be on your podcast. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so I mentioned that you're the founder of a group called Conscious Asians, but can you give our listeners a little bit of background about who you are, what you've done, and what made you even want to uh, be the founder of this group of Conscious Asians? (laughs) Okay, well, given the context that you mentioned, uh, in the name of this podcast, Silicon Valley through Spirituality, this really resonates with me. I was working as a Silicon Valley engineer, at Khan Academy, uh, at Google, um, at some machine learning startups. Uh, I even helped uh, Obama fix uh, his healthcare.gov website uh, when I was still a student in college uh, in Canada. And I was quite high off of the external validation, the career achievement um, that I achieved very early on. And then when I started working, I realized that I had put all of my effort and attention into my academic and career achievements um, and track and without uh, really looking at my personal life, relationships, or any sense of spirituality. I didn't even know what that was. Um, And along the way, as I was working, um, there were new other areas that I wanted to delve into, like some of these other areas. And I realized I was such a beginner in some of these. Um, I wanted to have a fulfilling relationship. I wanted to have a social life. I wanted to have my own interests. Um, And um, along the way, I uh, took up therapy, meditation, started reading about like, what do I actually want in my life now? You know, what, what is happiness and how do I attain happiness in the long term? That opened me up to Buddhist ideas, uh, and at Burning Man, um, about eight years ago, my mind, my heart just really opened up um, with everything that I experienced there, and particularly on psychedelics. um, I I experienced what uh, I had read about as possible, um, this state of, you know, when 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 they say like, bliss or you're not yourself and these buddhist concepts um or you're not your thoughts um like okay that sounds nice in theory and um you know my friends would tell me hey you're not bad and i'm like well i i don't i didn't really get that they're just trying to make me feel better but i i am bad obviously um but then i i actually experienced like my pure heart um who i am underneath all of that and it was astounding it was like my shame, my fear, um, worries just dropped away. And I, I felt alive. I felt clear. Um, 
I loved everybody unconditionally. I loved myself. And I knew that, and I, it felt so good. And my actions from this place uh, stem from this higher self, as they call it, this, you know, that's not the conditioned mind. That's not like, well, I should do this because I'm bad or whatever, but just like, you know, what, what my heart really wants. And so that was a, a peak experience of sorts, a, like a, an experience, a spiritual awakening um, that then just set me on this path of like, wow, I need to not make this just a state, but a persistent way of being. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's going it, to, it's, and it's going to be worth it, even if it takes 10 years, even if it takes meditating hours a day, doing difficult challenges, um, or facing my fears. Um, and so since then, I've been on this path of meditating hours a day, facing my fears, doing all sorts of different programs, challenges, retreats, workshops, coaching, therapy, traveling, um, entrepreneurship, volunteering, uh, living in meditation centers, living in my car, quitting my job, uh, teaching, um, trying different careers, um, living in eco villages in Hawaii, all really to get at the essence of who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and who I am, it's, uh, I'm a very curious, curious person. Um, and, um, and also I want to, like, I, I'm, I, I, there's, there's all this love in my heart too, that I want to actualize into the world that I want to, um, you know, not just for it to be a feeling, but, uh, to create it somehow to, to, to allow it to manifest in the physical world. So that is, you know, a summary of my, spiritual journey from Silicon Valley to spiritual alley on that theme. And then on this, um, your second question about uh, how I started Conscious Asians, I never intended to start anything called Conscious Asians, actually. <clears throat> but it was through my journey um, that I noticed that like a lot, a lot of these spiritual workshops, um, these esoteric programs and retreats that I go to, there's not a lot of Asians, um, whether it's circling, uh, which is a form of authentic relating or luminous awareness Institute, which is, um, energy healing and, um, or energy medicine, uh, you know, Buddhist psychology, you know, all sorts of other stage shifting, uh, uh techniques or, uh, to like ecstatic dances, to plant medicine ceremonies, um, it's 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 rare for me to see another Asian or even or especially another Chinese um, or East Asian. And when I did, I would there would be this thing, this like almost a little awkwardness, but almost unspoken thing that's like, oh look, there's another Asian person. Um, and you know, sometimes we wouldn't really acknowledge it. Sometimes I wouldn't. I would even like not talk to them because I'm like, oh, there, there, it might be some internalized racism. We're like, oh, the, the Asian people, they're going to judge me, right? They're going to compare me, um, whether I'm better than them or not. And like, you know, here we're in these spaces where we're trying to like learn to be unconditionally loving and like accept all parts of ourselves. So it's almost like a, feels like this sort of weird contradictory mix of two different worlds. Um, so initially I would always be like hesitant um, but then in Hawaii, there were some, but then like, it's like after the initial hesitance, then there's the connection. Um, you know, when we do get over that, like awkwardness and we start connecting, we find we have a lot in common and we become like you know, in Hawaii where I was living at the time when I started this, like there were, there's just a very few Asians uh, among us who did, um, who was living in these eagle villages and we would connect a lot. Um, and then I was catching up with a friend and realized that, um, it was like, oh, wait, there's like, you know, a lot of our past, like a lot of things that we connect on, um, in personal development is like, has to do with our heritage, right? Like, um, in like healing sessions, I'm realizing a lot of my traumas came from, uh, my upbringing, which came from the conditions that my parents lived in, in China, going through the cultural revolution, um, through the uh, ideas and the beliefs of the people there. And also when I moved to Canada, um, 
the, the differences in culture there. Uh, so, um, so yeah, we, we, I decided just like, Hey, why don't we just put some of us Asian folks together in a chat thread and who do personal development, spiritual growth, uh, work and just see what, what, you know, um, resources we might want to share with each other. It's just a really random idea. And, uh, then I started this thing and it, uh, um, wasn't sure how to do it. I was like, should I make it a, should I tell people first? Should I, should it be on Facebook? Should it be on WhatsApp? Um, like, I, but then my friend was just like, just start it, just do it. It's like, okay. That was after men's group. And I was like, oh, and I just did it. Um, put some people together, wrote this like introduction of like why I feel this space is needed and what the parameters are, what the guidelines are and you know, how I'm my process, how I'm just like figuring this out and I'm like, now here it is. And then uh, a lot of people really resonated with it. <laughs> and that was two years ago. And from there, it, like people just kept adding more people. We had like um, video calls. We, we had an in-person retreat of like 15 people um, where like the youngest was early 20s, the oldest was early 50s. And it spanned like, you know, from established directors of somatic psychology at like famous universities and to, um, you know, people who are just starting the path and we explored all sorts of things. And there was definitely a lot of resonance in that room that we hadn't felt anywhere else. Um, and yeah, since then we just, it's still just a Facebook messenger thread, the same format from how we started it. We have a Facebook group, we have some other threads, but, um, there's definitely like a resonance here. People resonate with this and there's, uh, um, yeah, uh, we'll see where, where it goes from here. Yeah, well, congratulations for creating it. I definitely see it as a very useful vehicle for people that are looking to expand their consciousness but can't find their own tribe um, like you. I guess, you know, I didn't really think about it this way, but when I really look back, you know, I started going to raves in 97. I went to my first Burning Man in 99. Mm. Um, and... Mm. I just kind of thought of it as partying, but what I realized was this was kind of like the beginning of getting into a certain kind of like state of being. And at least mm. with the raves, you know, we're obviously taking MDMA, we're listening to music. Mm. And um, similarly to you, I was like the only Asian person there. And when I saw another Asian mm. person there, there was like the strong desire to like connect with them. Um, and just kind of see how their experience was like. But I remember, you know, being at the raves under the influence of these medicines, or I didn't think of it as medicine back then, but now I definitely do because it was the first time that I really dropped all of the masks, all of the social learnings that I had picked up on mm. and just allowed myself to be myself, you know, just dance with the music, mm. you know, tell people that mm. I liked that, you know, I love them or express, you know, my my general yeah. feelings towards them. And it was like such a freeing feeling. So I, I, I'm glad that, yeah. you know, you're bringing this more to the forefront. And what I wanted to ask you was, you know, based on the story that you just shared, I mean, there was like so much to unpack there, but I'll do my best, sure. is that, you know, it sounds like you were at Khan Academy, you were at Google. Was there like a specific incident that like, you're just like, I'm not happy, I'm gonna explore more? Or was it just that you thought, okay, hey, I'm working at these, really great companies. I thought I would feel more fulfilled. I'm not feeling that sense of fulfillment that I thought. And your curiosity took you to explore, you know, meditation, uh, silent retreats, plant medicines, things of that nature. Oh yeah. That's a really great question. There are definitely moments. And also the second, uh, applies to this, uh, eroding lack of, um, alignment and, um, lack of fulfillment. Um, so <laughs> I had a crush on someone at work and, uh, asked them out and it didn't work out. And up to that point, like, it felt like I was just on success after success after success in my career. And here in my personal life, I ran into like a roadblock and it's like, oh, how do I, you know, I, it, it, uh, it showed me what I really, like, I really wanted this like feeling. I really wanted this connection. Um, how do I do that? I have no idea. So I just Googled like how to get a girlfriend and started reading those books and those books were like, 
you know what? Stop reading. Just go out there and like get get social, be social, meet people, build up a, a thriving social life. And I was like, okay, well, how do I do that? I don't, I didn't have any friends when I was, well, I did, but like, I didn't really prioritize socializing. I was just working on startups and school projects and stuff. Um, so then, uh, I just, well, would go to a social event after social event, every event that I was invited to, um, and just talk to people. And I was stumbling and awkward at first, but it, uh, became more and more natural over time. And I, I and found myself surrounded by many loving friends. Um, and then, um, realizing that to progress, uh, socially also, there needs to be this like inner work. And so then that's when I started therapy coaching and, um, uh, found spirituality also, uh, from my coach actually. Um, but, uh, also as I started doing a lot of this inner work and, uh, my focus went from spending all my time on work, which I had previously found to be very, very fulfilling, um, especially at Khan Academy early on, there were only like eight people working there and I contributed quite a lot to the company, um, culturally and just mission wise and, um, uh, to then, uh, working like just a bare minimum, really. Um, you know, while others were quite focused, I was focusing my time and energy on my growth outside of work, socially, personally, spiritually. Um, so after, even though it was my dream job, um, after two and a half years, it no longer was aligned. Um, and I found myself, I had to push myself to do work. Um, and there were a few moments too, also when I, you know, at, at work and various other co uh, contexts that I realized that, oh, I don't have to keep working here anymore. Um, I could get a job elsewhere or I could even not work. Oh, that's an interesting concept. <laughs> and I remember going through like the artist's way, um, which is this, uh, uh, you know, you write these morning pages, like 20 minutes a day, you just write whatever's on your mind. And they also have these prompts for just getting you to think about, um, what your wildest dreams might be. And if you could do anything, um, you know, taking yourself out on these dates, um, uh, doing things like this. I realized that there were a lot of things I wanted to explore that wasn't just working or getting a better job. Uh, and then the idea of a sabbatical became so interesting, like taking like six months where I'm not working. Um, and so, so yeah, I quit my job and instead of trying to get like a better job after that, I went on this sabbatical and I tried, you know, I did various things I wanted to do, like live in a meditation center, um, and I actually lived out of my car. I went traveling and did some other stuff, uh, learned learning dance, um, did a lot of meditation. Um, but then uh, this, this sabbatical, I realized I could extend if I get a part-time job. And I wasn't trying to get a part-time job to extend it. I was just like, oh, I wanted to visit my friend in San Diego because he's working on this company that I think is really cool that I really aligns with my heart and I want to just meet him. And, and then I end up like, he's like, you can do whatever you want, <laughs> you know, work on as long as you want or as short as you want. So I ended up getting a part-time job from that. And then also I was wanting to like travel and explore different places in the U S um, because the, the U S is a beautiful country, so many national parks. I wanted to go to those places. And I also, I didn't want to, um, keep paying California rent. Um, so, and I wanted the adventure of what it'd be like to move into my car because I was backpacking and I was happy backpacking. And I didn't need much. Um, and it would be a chance to explore minimalism. So perfect. Moving into my car, then I could extend my time not working too. And you know, that was like six years ago. Um, <laughs> and my life has just, I, I, I'm still on sabbatical in some sense, but, um, it, it's, it's like, I, I have done other work, other projects since, um, but it's, it's like a lot more blended with my life now. 
Mm. Oh man, I love that story. And as you were telling that story, I quickly realized this podcast is like the number one nightmare of every Asian parent since I interview so many um, overachieving ah. Asian people that have talked about not finding you know, fulfillment and purpose, seeking things externally and then changing their lifestyle and feeling so much better by going internally and really exploring the things that truly bring them joy, truly are uh, inspirational and passionate uh, uh, about. And well, what I really loved about what I was hearing was that um, you really kind of like jumped full into this. You know, it was like, all right, we'll take a short sabbatical. And then that sabbatical became a six month thing. And then now I hear the end of the story. It's been six years of this lifestyle. And so I guess one of the things that you brought up that I really love about you, there's a lot of things that I love about you, but, um, you know, we talked about just about parents right now, right? So your parents came from China uh, to Canada, and then you became a software engineer at Khan Academy at Google. You decide to go on a sabbatical. I'm just curious, how did your parents react when you were telling them that you were going to make this change in your life? This is a very great question because yes, um, my parents were once very proud of me for, you know, meeting Obama when I was like 22 years old and uh, getting this, getting a job at Google when I was 19. And um, and then like, here I am, you know, they could boast about me to all their friends. (laughs) And then here I am in, in my prime not having a job, being a bit of a bum, um, lost. Uh, and they were confused. Um, I think my dad was trying to tell me that, you know, he could see that I was unhappy, actually. There was a time when I was doing this, living out of my car. It's not all glory. It's like being in the middle of suburban America, in the middle of nowhere, it, like going, seeing driving past cornfields and just, you know, strip malls and eating at these random fast food restaurants. I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I once had a social identity as someone who worked at a very reputable company with a great mission and everyone, and I got a lot of respect from people. Um, but now what am I doing here in the middle of nowhere? Um, so my parents could see that I was lost and they wanted to help me. Um, and my dad told me that, hey, you know, the way I found the way to a happy life was I, I had a wife, I got kids, I had a house, and I have a career. And that's made me happy. And um, hearing this, I, I felt such repulsion. This is exactly what I do not want right now. You do not want any of these things. Um, in fact, I want to just travel. Um, so they were upset um, or they were confused, at, but I just followed my heart anyway. And I traveled. I went to China uh, to teach this summer camp for kids on empathy, overcoming fears, other life skills, entrepreneurial skills. And two weeks in, I was so, so happy and fulfilled. I felt so happy being the space holder for these kids to share so much of their inner feelings um, that they had no other context to before in their families with their other classmates. I had so much fun creating these safe, vulnerable spaces for people to bond and share and know that they could have the experience that I had at Burning Man um, of, like you said, um, you know, sharing how we actually feel towards one another, being vulnerable, accepting parts of ourselves that we didn't think could be accepted. Um, And on that call with my parents, they could see the big smile on my face, how happy I was. And then they were happy for me. Because ultimately what they want is they want me to be happy. Yeah. And from my dad's point of view, he doesn't know this quit your job, go on a sabbatical, find your, you know, soul sort of thing. He just, 
the, the, the standard thing. Um, so he was trying to help me be happy because he could see that I was lost in his way, in the world that he knows. And here I, um, I, I did it my way. Um, and, but ultimately we were after the same things. He wanted the same thing for me that I wanted, which was this happiness, fulfillment, sense of safety and stability. Well, less so that that, but for me, it's more about the fulfillment. Um, and, and that's the same. Um, and when I, when he could see that I was living my dream, then he was no longer on my case. Um, and, and they got it. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so a little after that also, um, I'll, I'll pause there and then there's more I can say with regarding my relationship to my parents. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I love the story that you shared. It very much uh, mirrored a lot of my own experience. You know, I had worked for five startups that had successful exits. When I told my parents I was going to start my own company, they were super happy. Then I told them I was going to start a cannabis company and they were thinking, what the hell are you thinking? You know, you're going to become some professional drug dealer. And ultimately, you know, after a few years, they saw how happy I was and they realized, okay, this is what makes my son happy. And they were happy for me. And, you know, what really kind of stood out to me is um, I'm an Asian American studies major. I've spoken to so many Asians about like generational trauma, things of this nature. But what you said to me is a microcosm of how I believe a lot of Asian parents are misunderstood by their kids is the Asian parents, they just want their kids to be happy. But the way that they were brought up, um, you know, like with, you know, like we talked about my in-laws grew up in the cultural revolution, food, necessities, things of that nature were just, that's what they wanted. They wanted some consistency. So when they look at their children, they want their kids to have that same consistency without realizing that, hey, you know, like our children are growing up in a different time. They have different desires. They have different needs. They have different wants. And they're not able to adjust their framework to the modern framework. But when you really think about it on a meta level is they wanted the same thing as you, which was to make you happy. And I myself experienced this because I was like, man, I'm in my 40s. My dad is still telling me to get my MBA. I telling him I have five MBAs working for me right now. But in his mind, he thinks that if I get the MBA, I'll always be hireable by someone. And he just really wants me to have a safe, consistent life. And, you know, I can't be mad at him for that. And, you know, even though uh, he's passed away, but he would say it to me like every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, and it would annoy me so much. But now that he's gone and I realize that was his way of showing me love, I'm like, wow. You know, literally every time my dad saw me, he was really looking out for me. But at that time, I, I received it as nagging, you know. And so before he passed away, I was able to communicate to him that, you know, I knew that his way of expressing love was different than what I grew up with in Western culture. And I appreciated all the times he was nagging me, even though I would shut down immediately when it was actually happening in real time. Oh, Sabo, that is so beautiful what you shared. And I'm so glad that you're able to, before his passing, see it that way and, you know, really be able to receive his love while he was still alive. And you know, not need him to change or understand your way, um, but for you to understand him and where he's coming from. Exactly all of that, everything that you just said, they do come from different times, um, generations, cultures. So, um, yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, and you know, just to add one more thing that was really beautiful about that incident was that he actually turned to me, and just give me a second, I'm just gonna let this dog in. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. Come say hi to Uncle Dave. Come say hi to Uncle Dave. Aww. Hello. Aww, look at you. <laughs> All right. You just chill out next to me. Was that okay? So, what he told me actually um, before he passed away was that he could recognize in me that not only was I a better husband to my wife, 
but I was a better father to my children than he was, you know. So in a way, he wow. actually showed a lot more kind of like granularity in his view. You know, I just thought he was, you know, just like your average immigrant parent, just work, 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 you know, expect my mom to clean the dishes, cook dinner and then just sleep and then uh. do the same thing. But, you know, when he told that to me, I was like, oh, wow, he was actually you know, kind of like paying attention and seeing the differences of how I was interacting with my wife and my children. And it really made me feel so good that, um, that he was doing that. And tangentially, what I realized was my father was a CEO and that's why I became a CEO. And after he passed away, mm -hmm. all my desire to run companies went away and I realized, oh, wow, I was really looking for oh. my dad's approval this whole time. And after he passed away, you know, I was able to shift my life into a different chapter because I realized that I did have my father's acceptance and him telling me that really allowed me to explore a different facet of myself that I hadn't explored before. I love that. Wow. That is a powerful, powerful story to share that so often we don't realize it, but we are chasing the approval of our parents um, and that there is this liberation that can be had when we you know get their acceptance or when we, when we realize that subconsciously we've been chasing for that approval yeah um, yeah. yeah thank you for so sharing you, that mm -hmm. yeah uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to share mm -hmm. that. And so you had mentioned that mm -hmm. there was kind of like a part two to this whole thing about your parents. And so <laughs> I wanted to bring it back to mm -hmm. uh, continuing with your story. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that the theme of parents is something that comes up a lot in our conscious Asians group um, because we are in this culture where our parents are they have lived different lives different experiences and it, there's such a gap especially in uh, if you grow up in the west and um so with my story i realized that i don't actually know my dad very well um or my parents in fact I usually see my parents as my parents. Um, and by that, I mean as this role, as, well, you're here to provide for me and you know, you could, you could have done a better job in these ways and you failed me in these other ways. Um, you should know these things and um, should be more like this. Uh, but then I think I was in, in a, um, uh, a medicine ceremony with an Asian facilitator who was actually in the ceremony sharing with me the experience of her father and their relationship and also her or his, his passing. Um, and something about it all like so touched me, um, you know, hearing that, um, that yeah, um, and, 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 and just help me see that my dad is also human and will one day pass too. Even though I know this intellectually, something about receiving that on the medicine made it like a lot more of a um, like embodied, uh, like felt um, experience. And then from after that, I had a couple of months before I I was going to go on to my next project. Uh, and so during that time, I thought it would be, I, I'm actually like, like, what would happen if my dad passed away today? Because it could happen. And I realized that, well, if that happened, I would really regret not actually getting to know who he is as a human being, as a friend as someone that I had just met on the street or at a party. What is he like? What is his childhood like? What are his values? And what, what, what are his dreams? What is his favorite food or favorite color or whatever? Um, so 
then during my time, um, when I had some free time, I was just like, hey, Dad, you know, I actually just want to get to know you as a human. Mm -hmm. I want to, like, have a bunch of questions. You know, you open to me asking? It's like, yeah, of course. And so then I just bombarded him with questions of all sorts, just whatever I was curious about. Mm -hmm. And um, so interesting. <laughs> um, and, and we got, like, more and more... Like as we as we got comfortable, you know, we started with the easy sort of lighthearted questions to some of the other ones, like his childhood heroes, to then like his struggles, to then like you know stuff that I consider taboo, like that we never talk about as Asian parents. Like, what were his relationships like? Relationships with <laughs> women, <laughs> and um, we we got to such a point um, that he shared probably one of the most vulnerable things. Um, with me, and I'm not going to share it in public um, to protect his privacy. And, our, um, and he also asked, but it was, um, it was something that really was a turning point in his life that was a big crisis for him that he was able to navigate through that, um, you know, and, and also one of those things that carries like shame and other things, um, uh, but that he was able to talk to me about it. And we had never talked about it. I knew this happened, but we just never talked about it. And when he and after he did, I was able to hear what that was like and the um, what he had to rely on to get through that experience. Uh, he had to fall back to his values, which uh, were some of the more traditional masculine um, values of like loyalty and um, like enduring hardship and uh, sort of this, you know, uh, you know, it, it, almost like, like, just integrity, like a lot of like, um, you know, what, what that looks like for him. And then um, two things happened. One, he said that, well, one, one I, I saw who he really is as a spiritual being, you know, not as a father, not as a role, not as the he like do this father thing right but it's like oh this is who he really is underneath even his asianness underneath his being a man underneath underneath um all the other social identities this is like his core soul almost um mm. and then you know he told me that i was his best friend wow wow so that was really cool, really interesting. I didn't expect that. I wasn't going for that. It just came from a pure place of curiosity, um, and it led to this. And I am really grateful to have had that exchange to really get to see my dad um, for who he is. Yeah. You know, um, I think the realization that you had um, the fact that you don't have children is quite impressive. You know, I think when people have children, they start realizing like, oh, wow, you know, I don't really know my parents, you know, I, like, you know, for me, it was like, I would love my kids to know me in a way that, you know, kind of like my wife knows me, but I came to the same conclusion as you. It's like outside of my parents taking care of me and what they do and what I've known in their adult life. Like, I, I don't know, like what their childhood dreams were like, what their dating life was like, what their aspirations or how they were like in high school or college you know any of that and i love that you were so curious to have these conversations and then not only were you able to get him to speak but you really saw him beyond being a father beyond being a chinese male and really to the essence of who he was as a person so i really want to commend you you know in the short time that we've known each other if there's one thing that i've learned about you is that when you're interested and curious about something you go super deep into it and you know yes. we share a common friend ck and um obviously uh i don't ask him about you know what he's doing and what you're coaching each other or, or what he, how you guys are working together but he has told me that if every client was like david i would be like so happy <laughs> and just like in, in cloud nine so Aww. You know, like I just wanted to reflect that back to you because um, what I'm learning about you is is why I wanted to interview you is like, hey, there was something within you 
letting you know to be curious to explore something and you trusted it and by trusting it um, you've been able to open so many more doors for yourself and I kind of want to bring it back to something a little bit earlier that you talked about was like you had this peak experience but then you were like you know what I want this to be a way of being for me um, yes can you describe that that mindset because my major I don't want to even say it's a gripe but you know when I see how plant medicines are marketed to people um you know most of the people that ask me about it their their thought is like okay hey i'll invest the time go to south america i'll spend a week or two down drinking ayahuasca and then i come back and everything's gonna be all right you know <laughs> and so you and i are experienced enough to know that that is a peak experience but there needs to be some integration in order for you to bring this back into your daily habits so i was curious you know like how did you make that mental jump towards like, hey, this is a peak experience. I experienced oneness with God. I'm good. You know, I'm elevated in consciousness to like, okay, wow, this is just a peak experience. But if I want to experience this every day, I'm going to need to cultivate some sort of practice to get my frequency to this specific resonance. Sabo, I love your questions. They just flow so seamlessly and bring us to one interesting, juicy, important topic to the next. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, integration after plant medicine ceremonies and shifting from peak experiences to really elevating our way of being on a persistent basis. Uh, like I said, this was something that I made a commitment to do in my spiritual awakening. I remember while I was on the psychedelic, I declared actually to my friend who was I was talking to that whatever it takes, I'm going to like work towards embodying this way of being. And I asked my friend to hold me accountable to it. And and I was even talking into my phone journaling and I was saying like, David, whatever it takes, it, it, get back into this like place on like make this who you are um and so it was like i knew while i was high that this was like a temporary state and i also knew that this was who i really am mm. uh, underneath it all <laughs> so i knew that this is it's possible to be this um because it's it's it's, it's just underneath all the other thoughts and stuff, um, uh, all, the, all, the, all the conditioning, all the trauma. Um, and so then after that, I went on this like, yeah, and, and yeah, thank you for um, sharing my, you know, you, you really got me when I'm curious about something, I go, I go jump into the rabbit hole, both feet in. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I just started exploring like everything, reading the books, doing meditating for an hour a day, two hours, three hours a day doing everything I could find um, uh, and yeah, working with um, coaches, with therapists um, have been a significant help here in, in integrating uh, the experience in, you know, like what are, and, and yeah, practices, like what meditation practices, what somatic practices, what, um, you know, uh, inquiry techniques, um, uh, all, all sorts of things uh, that I've learned and brought into my life can I have that can momentarily not just, you know, seek that peak experience, but like right now um, shift me so that I can connect with my higher knowing um, and allow that to flow through me in whatever I'm doing in the moment. Um, the work that I'm doing, the person I'm interacting with, right now so um so yeah to answer your question it's uh you know i had realized it initially and i also still do plant medicines um because i do believe that having these experiences every so often helps you know we we see our we see our life from a higher perspective and then and then we have to do the work to then like what i like to do is after uh, these 
experiences where I'm a lot more open up to then journal and reflect on like what changes I want to make in my life, how I want to be, and then share that with a coach, with a therapist to then work on making concrete changes in my life. Like have that conversation with this person and actually show up in this way. Um, and yeah, CK has been one of those coaches who's been helping me with that, with this, uh, the CPR technique, um, context, purpose, and results. He really loves it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's many techniques uh, for that. It's, it's integrated. It becomes who you are. Um, yeah. yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you'll get a kick out of this. When I told CK that I was doing this podcast, the first thing he asked me was, do you have a CPR for this podcast? And I told him I didn't. So I went and wrote a CPR for this podcast so that I could explain it to someone, you know, what's, what's the contest, the purpose and the results that I want from it. But you know, what I heard from your explanation was that you realized in this peak experience that this was a state that you'd like to tap into more consistently. You held yourself accountable by telling a friend and then you also gave yourself like an audio note on your phone. So, you know, it's like, all right, I said it, you know, this is something I'm going to commit to. And then what it sounded like to me, it, it wasn't like some magical, metaphysical, spiritual process. It was just like, hey, I'm going to journal down my thoughts. I'm going to write down the way I want to show up. And then I'm going to share it with someone that could help guide me towards that direction and then simply doing the work. Yeah, pretty simple, straightforward. Um, yeah, it's just like bit by bit. It's like, um, how can I show up more of who I want to be in this moment, in the next moment, with this person, with that? Um, yeah, it's just, it's like you want to build a, build a castle. You want to, it, you, you layer it on stone by stone by stone. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, okay, so we have about another 15 minutes here, so I'm trying to manage our time because I know we could chat about so many things, is, you know, I talked about integrating some of this metaphysical knowledge, this deeper insight into, you know, the practical, tactical ways of regular life. Um, so, you know, I know you talked about six years being on this uh, kind of sabbatical, sometimes living out of your car, sometimes living in retreat centers. Mm -hmm. But I also know mm -hmm. that you're still a, a founder. You know, can you uh -huh. uh, uh, let us know a little bit about what you're working on today on, you know, more of the business yeah. side? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. So, yes, um, as much as I am on the sabbatical where I'm following my heart, living a very free spirit of life. I am also a founder and it's, I don't, it's not like, Oh, I'm a founder. So what should I create? It's more like, Oh, um, here is what I want to see in the world. And then like coming from there. So for me, it was, I was in these meditation centers in my car, I was meditating hours a day. Um, and I felt all this love in my heart um distinctly and i also distinctly felt this almost like lack of self concern in the sense of like you know i want to give my life i want to i want to devote it to something greater than myself and then came the question of well how do i actually do that um how do i not just have this love be this feeling in my heart, but how do I like actually impact, affect um, people, beings um, to actualize this? So yes, I've been uh, an entrepreneur. Um, I've uh, you know experimented with coaching with uh, especially beginning engineers to help get them jobs. That was fun initially, but then wasn't as fulfilling. Um, I then actually, uh, it was, it had to do with money um, in my relationship with money. Uh, so going from Silicon Valley, there was 
it's very easy to make money in Silicon Valley. It never was a thing for me. Now then, going into the spiritual alley, living in meditation centers, reading about Gandhi, it's like, wow, you know, um, I don't need money, actually. In fact, money can be a hindrance to living the spiritual life. Like, I want to, if I really want to empathize with the people that I want to help with, with everybody, then I need to live like they do. I need to experience, I can't just be a privileged tech person in Silicon Valley. I also need to like experience the others. Um, so I had such a hunger and curiosity to experience the other dimensions of life. Um, but then as I traveled and also with the same um, medicine person, Asian medicine person, I, she, she told me something about money which is that money is a form of, is a way of directing the energy on this physical plane. And so when I saw it through this sort of metaphysical lens of what money is, it then no longer became as value laden of good or bad, um, but just a tool. And so I thought, oh, well, I could use this tool to amplify the love that I feel into, in my heart um, as action, as actual changes in the world. Well, I have skills. I've, you know, won these AI contests, these compiler, you know, software engineering contests before. Uh, math, that's, I can, what if I use these skills to like create a lot of money and then help the world in some way? And so while I was like exploring that, exploring, okay, well, maybe investing, like that's, that's something I'm curious about. Blockchain, I'm curious about that. It's like, just as a technologist, I've been in blockchain. Uh, I actually tried to buy my first Bitcoin in 2011. Um, and, you know, I'm curious about its potential impact for, uh, you know, yeah, politically um, and economically. Um, the, and I, don't know, I was talking to a friend about uh, blockchain and the applications of it and how it can help create more of the ideals that we want in our society. So then um, the idea, and it just sort of happened that I was, I had, I had been investing in crypto during my sabbatical and my crypto portfolio did really, really well. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, wow. Um, and I was on a hike, and, and I remember this just these words popped in my, into my mind of like crypto hedge fund and then institutional investor. And so then, like four months, six months later, I found myself starting a crypto hedge fund um, while I was <laughs> dancing on the beach in Maui. Uh, I met my business partners from different, like, in different aspects, <laughs> um, and it's like. That's actually how it happened, although they were introduced by friends of friends, but we met on uh, day while dancing on, on the beaches. Um, so that is what I'm up to now. I'm running a hedge fund called Open Heart Capital with a goal of donating profits towards um, what I see as a more beautiful world. So, you know, a more regenerative world one where everybody is better off, where um, uh, those who have material abundance can have uh, a sense of inner peace and happiness. And those who have, let's say, a lot of social connections but, um, and you know, joy, but maybe are not as materially well off and could have more in that sense, can have the means to create um, their, their dreams. Um, and then also to uh, support some of the causes that I believe are, is going to increase the, the thriving in this world. Um, for example, like indigenous wisdom, protecting the rainforests, um, helping ensure the survival of our uh, species, of, of many other species. Um, you know, and, and then ultimately, how do we shift into a, a new system so that we're not incentivized to exploit and each other exploit the earth so that it's, it's more life affirming? Mm, yeah, I love that. Um, you know, uh, 
for those that haven't listened to the spiral dynamics episode, go listen to the spiral dynamics episode because a lot of what I'm going to say is going to make a lot more sense here. But um, when someone goes from the stage orange achiever stage and then discovers the stage green, uh, more internal uh, peace, internal um, fulfillment stage is that there's this natural rejection of materialism, money, things of that nature. And I really love the story that you told about um, the medicine person that you're traveling with. And she talked about, yeah, money is just like this energy flow. And it's just a tool that you use. And just like any tool, you know, if you have, uh, like you could use a, a hammer to create a house and you could use a hammer to smash a house too. And depending on your relationship with the money, you know, that energy flow will have a different feel and resonance to it. So I love that um, she was able to allow you to see that, you know, people with a lot of money, if they're behaving in a greedy way, that doesn't mean that money is for greedy people. Money is just the thing, you know, and how you utilize it is ultimately um, how it is received by other people. And then the other thing that you brought up that I really loved is that you were looking for ways for people who have a lot of money, a lot of material goods to access more inner joy. And for those with a lot of inner joy um, to also have access to more, you know, material things that can make them happy. And I love that because Growing up, I grew up in a time where you were either hustling and making things happen and you're sacrificing your time, health and relationships to be, you know, like the Elon Musk or the Steve Jobs of the world, or you were on this spiritual journey and, you know, you would have to couch surf and ask your friends to allow you to live rent free every so often because you're struggling with finances. And what you're saying here is like, no, these two things don't need to be mutually exclusive. We are holistic human beings. We can have it all if we just know how to prioritize and take the appropriate actions and optimize our life for all of those things, not just one or the other. Is that correct? Absolutely, uh, Sabo. And this is a great place to name Spiral Dynamics because yes, like you say, you know, as one move, moves from stage orange, orange to stage green, then there can be this rejection of stage orange values. And then at some point there's this reckoning of like, oh, these are all, it's helpful in this context, not helpful if it's taken to be its own thing and, you know, for its own end. But, you know, how can we use these as different tools? How can we, um, you know, how can I not just be a spiritual person? How can I not just be a, business person or an engineer, but how can I actually straddle both worlds? How can I have business help me actualize my spiritual values so that I can actually be even a more like spiritually integrated person in the world? Um, and how can I use my spiritual values to guide my business so that it's, you know, aligned with who I am? Um, mm -hmm. And actually use, use spiritual values to actually help create the business in a better way. Um, and, and, you know, have it be more successful. Um, so yes, it's been such an interesting exploration because I've been, I would find myself living, living in Hawaii in eco villages with, um, people who are really seriously dedicated themselves, exploring the spiritual paths, who are living on food stamps, who are dancing all day, who are really like loving. Um, but who wouldn't really have a relationship with business or money or science um, and would see that as the matrix that is creating all the problems as, as, as the system um, that they, they, they've escaped out of, but also have this, core, this, this uh, disempowerment, this economic disempowerment, and, and always feeling like they're lacking um, that way. And on the other hand, then I also I'm in the world of business where you know people can be very successful, but may not be internally happy or, or fulfilled. Um, and I'm, I'm on this, you know, it, it doesn't have to be one or the other. And, and I am actually on my journey now meeting people who are very dedicated to both worlds. And it's less common it's to meet to find these people, but they, they are there, they're out there. And it's such, um, 
you know, I, I feel such a, uh, an excitement to meet more like-minded souls. Yeah, me too, me too. And hence, you know, the purpose of this podcast was to bring these like-minded souls together and to have awesome conversations. And, you know, I'm definitely mm. going to have you on because I want to talk about ecstatic dancing. I want to talk about channeling. <laughs> I want to talk about a whole bunch of other things that we don't have time today. But um, what I do ask all of my guests are this one question before we sign off for the day, which is if you could go back in time and just talk to a younger version of yourself. It could be the college version. It could be the per version that was at Khan Academy. It could be the elementary school version of David Who. But if you could go mm -hmm. back in time, and I know we both know that time is not linear, but in the, in the case of 3D space time and the world that we're living in and the dimensions that we're living in today, if you could go back in time and tell your younger self something, what would you like to communicate to that younger version of David? Mm. <coughs> Well, what comes to mind is you are perfect and you're beautiful and you're okay just as you are. And you are perfect, you are beautiful, you are just okay the way that you are. You're, you're, you're okay just as you are because I received a lot of messages or that my younger self internalized as that not being the case. Um, and... You know, I, I feel that I'm really on a journey to wholeness, uh, on a journey to reclaim all parts of me and still on that journey to you know, know in every fiber, every cell of my being, that which I realized during my awakening of my own inherent wholeness and perfection. And you know, I feel that is so core and dear to my heart. For me to know that dearly and for for everybody to know that dearly and um uh and, and so it's, it's less of like an advice less of you should do this be more like that but just it's more of this uh more of like a healing that i want to send to my younger self and you know if i did have something i wanted to say as like um you know that's more let's say uh an action oriented it may be um, explore, have fun. Um, <laughs> one, th one thing that uh, I used to tell myself um, when I would answer this question is I would tell my younger self to learn to dance. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. As, as a computer engineer who spent all his time in front of the computer playing video games or programming, I did had I had no connection to my body, to my intuition, to my to my right brain, and I've been spending so much time lately developing that sense, and like it's now my greatest joy to dance and move and express myself, and I have I derive so much happiness from it, and people around me they feel it and they come up to me after and tell me how much they loved watching me dance and move, um, so. And I feel that if I had started that earlier in my life, I would be more whole, I would be more happy, I would be more connected, I would skip, I would have less of the, the suffering that I later had in my life. And um, yeah, I would be a more balanced person. Yeah, I feel that too. And you know, I love that the first thing that you would say had nothing to do with advice. It was just like, you are whole and complete. You are mm. worthy just yeah. for your existence. So I really love that. Yeah. And I also very much resonate with, I mean, I would say the thing that really drew me towards you was watching a video of you dancing. Okay. Because, you know, we live in an information age right now. And I think access to a lot of these topics that we're talking about, you know, you could easily access these. So I often encounter a lot of people that can, intellectually from a knowledge perspective you know talk about these ideas with me but i very much put people into like hey this person has knowledge and this person has wisdom and the person that has wisdom has embodied that knowledge and so when i saw you dancing i was like oh this guy definitely is not just like saying these things he's like living it he's expressing it through his body and as someone i've loved martial arts i've loved break dancing i love expressing myself like it's very inspirational just watching you not do dance moves not do dance steps just moving in the way that david who 
feels like moving, right? Like, just like right now, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. So I love you, David. And if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about what you're doing, how can they find you? Oh, yes, you can find me on <laughs> uh, Facebook, David Who, H-U, um, Khan Academy, sometimes if you type that, there's lots of David Who's. Find me on Substack, my, my blog, davidwho.substack.com. Uh, open uh, in, Instagram, Open Heart Journey. I'm just starting that it's a project to share my learnings. Um, so, yeah, that should do it. All right. And what about your hedge fund? Tell people about your hedge fund a little. Oh, yeah. Open, open Heart Capital, openheart.capital. Um, we've had over 40% returns this year so far for an algorithmic crypto hedge fund. So uh, it's fully automated. Uh, and uh, regardless if the market moves up or if the market moves down, we profit. And ultimately, the goal is to donate profits to those projects that we that I talked about, um, that I really care about, that are dear to my heart, that I feel would create a more thriving, beautiful, interconnected, loving, abundant, nourishing, uh, happy world where people can dance like they. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. (laughs) All right, everyone. So uh, before we sign off, I just wanted to recap some of the things that really stood out to me. And what really stood out to me was number one, you don't have to either be a left brain or right brain person. We have two hemispheres. Everyone has two hemispheres in their brain. And growing up as an Asian that was bad at math, you know, I, I think I was like, oh shit, I'm bad at math. I gotta be really good at communication. So I really focused on that side. But I had the opposite as you was when I started designing my vaporizers and I had to get into engineering, thermodynamics, laminar flow. I was like, wait, I'm actually good at math. I just needed a vehicle that got me more interested in numbers and physics and things of that nature. And I love that you kind of came from the inverse, which was you're sitting in front of a computer screen and you're like, you know what? I want to fucking dance. I want to move my body. I want to feel things, not through my head, but through my heart. So I'm really glad that we're both on this journey together, David, and your energy, your joy, it is infectious. Thank you so much for coming on. And um, yeah, I just a lot of gratitude for us to connect. And um, if anyone wants to learn more, it's Open Heart. Uh, what, Open Heart was the name of the fund, correct? Openheart.capital is the website, yes. Okay, openheart.capital. openheart.capital. And if you want to uh, join Conscious Asians, if what you heard is invigorating you, is motivating you, just go look for it on Facebook, connect with David. And thank you so much again for being a wonderful guest on the Silicon Valley to Spirituality podcast. Sabo, that was amazing. Um, thank you so much for having me on as a guest. I'm glad that I got a dance <laughs> at the end of this and yes to everything you said really an honor to talk to all of you talk to your audience and uh yeah all right my man sola gria sola gria take care my friend